Hi, my name is Jason Kim. I'm a prosthodontist practicing in Seattle, Washington. Today, I'd like to talk about cements and cementation protocols. Personally, cementation day is like Super Bowl Sunday or the championship game. Preparation day is similar to the regular season, and uh, final impression is the playoff games. So delivery day is where it all comes down to, to emulate what you see on your models to be replicated and blended into your patient's smile. Now, does anybody know what this is? This is a dovetail connecting two pieces of wood together, and this is really how dentistry worked for many, many years. Uh, our preparations that we see uh, were worked on based on retention and resistance form, and this is the type of gold restorations that were done uh, over many years in dentistry. Now, these are pictures from my own practice. Uh, I took a practice over from a doctor who did beautiful gold work over the years, and these restorations have been in the patient's mouth for five to over 30 years. And these restorations work great, and these rely solely on mechanical retention, like you see here. Now, so when you're replacing a small composite restoration like this with a gold casting restoration, you need to have a dovetail design and uh, sharp line angles and good resistance and retention form so the casting can sit in the tooth itself and, and um, function as a good functioning restoration. Now, if you look at this type of crown, uh, this was not possible in the old days. Uh, you may think this is, looked like an ordinary crown, but if you look close, this is how the patient came into the practice. The patient broke the tooth off at the gum line and said, I just want a crown put back on. And I told the patient, well, that's not going to be possible because you don't have enough retention and resistance form. So we'll have to either do orthodontic treatment, extrude your teeth, do crown lengthening, and then restore the tooth, or do a root canal, place a post and restore it, or take it out, place an implant, or just do a bridge. And the patient said, none of those options that you had mentioned is, is going to work for me. Just put the crown on. I don't care if it falls off. Just let's just give it one more try before we take the tooth out. So I said, okay, let's try this um, bonded restoration. And I'll use the strongest cement that I know. And I cemented this crown. And the patient's been in function for more than three years. Another patient, this is a friend of mine. She's an orthodontist. Um, she consulted with many of her friends and surgeons, and they all concluded that this tooth should come out, and uh, rightfully so, because there's nothing left. But I said, before we take the tooth out, why don't we just give it one more try and try to put a crown on it? We can call it a long-term provisional restoration if we want to. Let's just see what happens. So, um, you know, the tooth was root canal treated, so I did a core buildup did immediate dead and sealing and bonded a lithium disilicate restoration on, on a molar. And it's been four years and the patient is still using this to this very day. I told the patient not to use this tooth at all, but she's been chewing on it and using it just like a regular tooth. And uh, it's been in there for a fairly long time. So it is a very predictable restoration to do if we use the right cements and the right protocols to bond the restorations in place. Now, these are all possible because of, uh, you know, a bonding has developed over the years. In the late 70s, Corre invented the first adhesive monomer in dentistry, and they call it the MDP, uh, functional monomer. Now, this uh, phosphate monomer is extremely effective for enamel, dentin, and also metal alloys. So, consequently, panavia which included the MDP monomer, was introduced really as a high-performance adhesive resin cement to adhere to the tooth structure and to the metal. Now, Corre started incorporating MDP into all of their bonding agents as well. Clearfill SC Bond, which is considered one of the gold standards of bonding. Now they have Clear SC Protect, which also has uh, antimicrobial effects and fluoride release, so which I like to use for my patients with high caries risk and also Clearfill Universal Bond Quick, which is a bonding agent that I often use with one of my cements, which I'll be talking about today. Panavia has also evolved over time. And uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about two of my favorite Panavia cements that I use in my practice, Panavia V5 and Panavia SA Cement Universal. 
and along came new materials, bondable glassy materials, I like to call it, or lithium disilicate restorations, and also uh, research and development in zirconia bonding has made us um, made it possible to bond these type of uh, zirconia restorations predictably to our two structure. Now, why cementation is so important? Like I said, it's really the championship game or the Super Bowl day because this is where everything comes down to. Everything that you've worked for with your lab, communicating shades and, you know, getting the shape right. Now, when it comes time to seat the restoration, you really want to avoid this type of disaster happening. Now, you can see that the margins around all of these restorations are quite open. And I assume that something went wrong during the cementation protocol or during the process. Perhaps the bonding agent that this person used was too thick or it wasn't air thinned enough and or it set up, uh, set up before the crowns were put on. So in order to prevent this, we're going to talk about uh, what kind of cements that can be used to prevent this type of accident and also um, how to approach our bonding uh, protocol. So we want to have restorations that look good but also that are seated completely and seals the tooth completely so that the patient can go about their days smiling with their natural looking restorations. So today uh, I'll be talking about predictable bonding of modern ceramics using modern resin cements. And when I talk about modern cements, it's not just about retention of the restoration. Um, it also is uh, has a critical role in reinforcing the inherent strength of the restoration. And this is really critical for uh, restorations like lithium disilicate. Now, all the flexural strength and the fracture resistance tests or strength that the companies like to talk about is usually based on uh, when the restoration is completely bonded to the substrate or the two structure. So if you don't bond those restoration appropriately to the two structure, your restorations are going to be significantly weaker. So this also plays into uh, my preparation design and the material selection, really, and uh, depending on which cement I'm going to be using for the restoration. So uh, I'd like to, I'll be again talking about Panavia V5 and Panavia SA Cement Universal. I'll first start off with Panavia V5. This is the cement that I use mostly, um, probably about 90% of the case in my practice. So let's start off with uh, the bond to two structure and how it bonds to the restorative material and the color stability of Panavia V5. Uh, this is, these are some internal data from Corre uh, showing the tensile bond strength to bovine dentin. And you can see that Panavia V5 has a similar bond strength to Clearfill SE bond, which is uh, again, one of the gold standards of bonding. And you can see from this uh, uh, data that HPC 100, which is the Panavia V5, has done really well. It has a really good shear bond strength to human dentin as well. And another data here uh, shows that uh, Panavia V5 also has pretty good shear bond strength to enamel and dentin. And this is just a self-cure mo mode. So obviously, um, I like cure uh, my Panavia V5 in addition. And I also etch the enamel as well. So I selectively etch the enamel before uh, bonding with Panavia V5 to increase the bond strength to enamel as well. Now let's look at the bond to restorative material. Uh, bond, bonding to zirconia and lithium disilicate is very predictable with Panavia. And also you can see that titanium bonds really well to Panavia V5 as well. So this is something that I like to use not only in the clinic, but I also like to use this in the lab. And I like to suggest my labs to use this material when they're bonding different components. And I'll be going over the protocols for that as well. And here it shows uh, the bond strength to uh, Katana Zirconia after it was sandblasted. And you can see that Panavia V5 has a pretty good bond strength, uh, even after 3000 thermal cycling and compared to other Panavia SA Cement Plus and also Unisem cements that are very popular out there. 
So looking at the color stability of Panavia V5, you can see that the uh, Panavia V5 has pretty good fluorescence and it also has good color stability over time. So um, because it does not have any amine in the cement, so uh, you don't have to worry about color changing. So when you're using this type of cement in the aesthetic zone, um, it's going to be important that the cement colors don't change uh, around those very thin veneers. So this is the cement that I also use when I'm using uh, in the aesthetic zone. So let's look at the physical properties of Panavia V5. It has good flexural strength and compressive strength. Film thickness is about 12 microns, which is very thin compared to uh, you know cements like zinc phosphate, which has 25 microns of film thickness. And it is also pretty radiopaque, and it releases fluoride. Uh, the curing time is about 10 seconds, um, so you want to be careful. You don't want to uh, over cure when you first seat the crown because it'll it'll cure relatively fast. So these are some of the properties, and we'll look at this and compare it to uh, SA Cement Universal uh, in just a little bit. So when do I use Panavia V5? Well, in the clinic. I usually use it for almost all my restorations. So crowns, whether it be zirconia, like you can see here, this is a case where the patient came in uh, with a severely discolored tooth on number eight. Uh, a composite restoration had been done, but the patient wasn't really happy with the aesthetics. So uh, I removed the composite and redid the crown here. Uh, this was a very difficult case because the number eight was ankylosed and it was buckly placed. So um, I couldn't prep more. When you have a discolored prep like this, you want to prep a little bit more so you can provide more space for the ceramics and the porcelain to uh, mask the discoloration. Um, but the patient was pretty happy with the aesthetic outcome of this restoration, and this was bonded with Panavia V5. This is another uh, zirconia uh, rehabilitation. Uh, this was with Katana STML, and the patient had uh, is a severe bruxer so uh, we had we used a very high strength zirconia and we bonded it with Panavia V5 uh, to resist her, uh, you know, strong clenching habits. And the patient can see her smile. She's very satisfied with her new smile. And I also use Panavia V5 almost exclusively for lithium disilicate over the years. So lithium disilicate um, is very important to bond it to the remaining two structure. Uh, you don't want to just loot it with the uh, looting cement or use something like zinc phosphate for lithium disilicate. So I use Panavia V5, which, you know, has consistently shown the highest bond strength to dentin. So if you're exposing a lot of dentin in your preparation, and if you want to use lithium disilicate restorations, it's really important for me that I use something, a very strong cement like Panavia V5. Now, if you're using a gold restoration, I also use Panavia V5 due to its low film thickness. Um, for this, I like to sandblast the gold and I use a primer, an alloy primer, and then I use Panavia V5. This will help uh, with the cement sticking to the gold uh, much better, and it has really good uh, retention as well. For partial coverage restorations, onlays and inlays, uh, I like to use lithium disilicate restorations, and because these don't have mechanical retention and some of the prep areas are really thin, it's really important that we bond these on there with Panavia V5 so that the restorations don't fracture uh, around the margins. And also for veneers as well, uh, non-retentive restorations, always you want to have something that bonds to the substrate substructure really, really well. So in this case, this was a veneer done for a patient, um, and uh, the restorations are, are holding on to the teeth really, really well. I also use Panavia V5 for fixed dental prosthesis. As you can see, this is a four-unit bridge replacing his old 30-year-old um, bridge here. Uh, and in this case, we use Katana HTML, uh, high translucency multi-layered. Uh, so, and we did a cutback all the way so the zirconia comes all the way to the incisal edge so that the incisal edges don't chip. As you can see in the previous slide, 
his uh, incisal edges were chipped a little bit in the previous PFM bridge. So we brought the zirconia all the way to the incisal edge and just layered on the facial only. These beautiful ceramics were done by our talented ceramist Sungbin Im. And here is, is the final result. The patient was extremely happy with the result of this bridge. And also we can use it for resin bonded uh, FDPs. So this case, the patient came to me, um, she had these two Maryland bridges done about eight years ago uh, in a different uh, office. And when, you know, a lot of research shows, you know, according to like, you know, Matthias Kern, and there's a lot of uh, good research out there that shows that a single wing uh, Maryland bridges work much better than uh, two wings. But in this case, two wings were used and, um, and the patient had been in function with these for almost 10 years. So I suggested to cut off one wing so we can bond it in back in place. But the patient really just wanted to, you know, just put it back in place. So I said, okay, we'll try it again. If it comes off again, and then we'll cut the cut one of the wings off. And she said, okay, we'll do that. So uh, we sandblasted it, cleaned it off, applied ceramic primers, and then we bonded it with Panavia V5. The patient was extremely happy with the final result here. And if you're using a cement retained implant restoration uh, on custom abutments like this, titanium, I like to use Panavia V5, especially if the framework or the superstructure that goes on top of those abutments are quite big and you want it to be retentive, I like to use Panavia V5. And this might be something that's probably um, not mentioned in, in the brochures, but uh, I'm sure some of you guys have this type of patient. A patient comes in, number eight broke off here, and obviously number eight is not savable at all. So we tell the patient we have to take the tooth out and place an implant, or we can do a three in a bridge, but you know, in this case, uh, uh, an implant would be much more preferable. And the patient for you know personal reasons, he just cannot do it at the moment and just says, can you just please put it back just for now? I will do the treatment later, but for now, I just really want this restoration bonded back in place. So I use different kinds of resin cements to bond this you know really short post uh, uh, connected to the crown back in place. And it would come off every other day. And so the patient was in the office multiple times. And so I ended up using Panavia V5 and it kind of ended and it stayed in the patient's mouth for about three months. So um, this is something that I like to use when I'm, you know, trying to temporarily cement uh, restorations and compromise tooth structure. Uh, Panavia V5 kind of works well as well. Now, that was the clinical part. In the lab, where do we use Panavia V5? When we're doing like screw mentable implant crowns, you know, like a with a tie base or a custom abutment, titanium custom abutment, and we're putting a zirconia superstructure on top of it. Uh, I like to use uh, Panavia V5. I like to sandblast a tie base and put a alloy primer on it, sandblast the zirconia and put ceramic primer in it. And then we glue the two components together with Panavia V5. And the same for tie bases for implant supported FDPs. Uh, you want to uh, you want to glue these um, tie bases into the structures really well. And just like the protocols I had talked about, sandblasting it. Um, and depending on the different types of zirconia, you want to have different pressures of, you know, pressures of sandblasting. And you want to uh, glue them in with Panavia V5. And I've been having pretty good results. I haven't had any tie bases that came out of the restoration. So here is the final result for this patient. So these are the materials that I need when I'm using Panavia V5 on the day of cementation. I need uh, etch, phosphoric acid etch for selectively etching the enamel. And I like to use Concepsis, which is a 2% chlorexidine to inhibit MMPs. And also it, it has an antibacterial effect. I also like to use Katana Cleaner, which also cleans the tooth and the restoration tooth primer for the V5 and ceramic primer on the restoration, and of course the Panavia V5 paste. Now, one of the things that I like about V5 the most is really this primer. Uh, Panavia V5, you don't have to use a bonding agent uh, 
prior to bonding the restoration. And that is really the reason why I like this cement so much. Uh, bonding agents, you know, no matter how thin they are, um, a lot of the uh, protocols recommend actually curing the bonding agent before seeding the crown. And you can air thin it, you can use high vac, you know, suction to, you know, suction out the excess, you know, bonding agent as much as you can. But sometimes if you have just a little bit of excess, you know, bonding agent in one, one corner of the tooth, the restoration does not seat all the way. And that's just one of the things that really makes me nervous. And so every time I want to have repeatability and predictability with my cementation uh, protocols. So I like to use this V5 tooth primer, which is, you know, a primer, you apply it after you clean the tooth and then you just air dry it and then you put the cement on right away. Even with this, the bond to dentin, it has one of the highest bond strength to dentin with Panavia V5. And that is really my, the number one reason why I like to use this cement. So let's talk about the cementation protocol. When the patient comes back in, you remove the temporary, you sandblast it, you clean it off. And then I use fit checker to try the restorations in to see, to check the internal fit. Uh, you can use occlude, you spray occlude onto your ceramic, ceramic restorations and then use occlude to actually see, see through the uh, occlude really well. And this occlude can pick up the uh, fit, uh, the fit checker can remove the occlude. Um, I don't always use this method, but this is one of the ways to do it. I just like to use the fit checker and I take it off and where I see the perforations, I just grind the preparation, not the restoration. Okay, so you check for proximal contacts, you check the margin. If the margin is really deep, you want to take a radiograph to make sure it's it's seated all the way or the margin is closed. And if you are adjusting the occlusion, just be very careful. Don't, you know, the patients, if they bite down really hard, you, they can fracture the restoration if it's, especially if it's a thin lithium disilicate restoration. So, uh, I usually, you know, I've been working with, you know, the same lab for over many, many years. So I usually don't have to adjust the occlusion. It's usually very, very slightly high. So there's just one or two spots I need to adjust and after cementation. So I usually like to adjust the occlusion after the restoration has been seated completely. Uh, but uh, you can check it before a seating if there is extensive occlusal adjustment that needs to be done. Okay. Now, again, don't adjust the inside of the restoration, only adjust the preparation only. And uh, don't use heavy forces during occlusal adjustments. Here's a video showing how I prepare my restorations in the lab after it's been tried in. So I use the katana cleaner to clean, um, to decontaminate the tooth. And then I use hydrofluoric acid you etch for about 20 seconds, rinse, and then I use phosphoric acid. This is for lithium disilicate restorations, okay? And then you scrub it in, agitate it. I put distilled water in the ultrasonic, and then I use blockout resin on uh, micro brushes, and I add it like this. I call it making lollipops, and then I add clear fill ceramic primer, remove the excess and I actually use a hair dryer to dry off the excess and then I put Vaseline around them outside so that uh, the cements don't stick to the final, the final restorations. So let's go over the bonding protocol to zirconia first with Panavia V5. So you, you take the crown off, you try it in, you check the margins, proximal contacts, everything, and you take it out, you disinfect it, and if you adjusted your occlusion, then you need to polish the um, occlusal surfaces or you know wherever you adjusted. And um, after you polish, I take it to the sandblaster and I sandblast it with 50 micron aluminum oxide under uh, one bar pressure for translucent zirconia, which is the one I like to use mostly these days. Then I steam clean it. I apply the katana cleaning agent for 10 seconds. You scrub it in. And the reason why I sandblast and use the Katana cleaner is, you know, a lot of researchers say once you sandblast, you don't have to add any other cleaning agents. But um, 
the reason why I like to use the Katana cleaner is not only do I like to just, you know, make sure it's clean, but I apply this on the outside around the margins because that's those areas also get contaminated too. But you can't really sandblast the outside of the crown around the margins. So I just sandblast the inside internally, uh, try not to nick the margins around the restorations. And afterwards, I clean it again with the Katana cleaner on the outside of the crown. Uh, and then I put it in distilled water and put it in the ultrasonic for five minutes. After it comes out, I put the uh, the blockout resin with the micro brush on the restoration. And then I put ceramic primer in there, scrub it in there pretty good. And then I dry it with a hair dryer to make sure all the excess uh, primer is gone. And it produces water as a byproduct in the primer um, set. So... Uh, I like to remove all of that. And after that's done, you should have like a kind of a dull uh, appearance on the intaglio surface, not a shiny surface. Uh, if you've done it, that's probably too much primer. And then it's probably going to reduce the bond strength a little bit. And afterwards, you can apply uh, Vaseline or some sort of lubricant on the outside of the restoration. And I do that for Panavia V5 because um, the cement sticks really, really well. So... Uh, I, and when I use the Vaseline on it, it helps with the removal process uh, a little bit. So uh, after polish, I like to use uh, these polishers from Cosmodent and Zircon Bright from DVA. Then I sandblast under a one bar pressure for 50 micron aluminum oxide. And this is for translucent zirconia, like four, five Y zirconias. If you're using like three Y, you can, you can sandblast it under two bars if you want to. Um, does sandblasting weaken zirconia? A lot of research has been done on this and actually shows that uh, air particle abrasion it actually improves the flexural strength of zirconia. And so, but grinding doesn't. So it's, it's more beneficial to actually sandblast the restorations. And, um, and what pressure should you sandblast it for different, you know, zirconia? As for 3Y, you can do up to two bars. For 5Y, like translucent zirconia, as you want to stay at one bar, this is really the sweet spot. Uh, this is a, a slide from um, dental tube, tubes uh, from Dr. Nate Lawson. His research has shown that uh, one bar of pressure for translucent zirconia uh, is really the best pressure to be used. And when do you have to sandblast? A lot of the times, the labs actually sandblast the crowns for you and they send it to you. Uh, I think it's probably more beneficial to do it right there in the lab. So right before, you have to do it 15 minutes uh, within the cementation if you want to sandblast and get the maximum effect, okay? Now, once you've done that, I do the pretreatment with Katana cleaners. You can see that uh, the contamination is, after it's contaminated, if you use the Katana cleaner, it's actually the bond strength goes back up to where it was before. You can put your restoration on a medicine cup with wax. I like to use Veneer Me from Smile on USA. So you can, it has like a little mesh that goes on top so you can rinse after you etch the restorations. If you're doing zirconia, don't use phosphoric acid. This will actually reduce the bond strength quite significantly. So don't use phosphoric acid for zirconia. And then I stick it to using Opal Dan blockout resin and a micro brush. I add the ceramic primer. I use my good old hair dryer to dry off the excess uh, liquid. Then I put Vaseline and then I seat the crown. Okay. The protocol for uh, lithium disilicate is very similar. The only difference is we have to etch the restoration with hydrofluoric acid 5% uh, for 20 seconds. And then I scrub with phosphoric acid for about 30 seconds. Okay. Now, a lot of a lot of people like to, you know, tell the lab to etch and apply the primer. Uh, I like to do it myself in the lab. So I usually tell the lab not to etch the restorations. Uh, and it's very important for lithium disilicate not to use aluminum oxide because that'll cause micro fractures and it'll weaken the restorations quite significantly. And you can even chip off margins in very thin areas. So for lithium disilicate, you want to use 50 micron glass beads and you want to use only one bar of pressure. You can see that as you increase the pressure for um, sandblasting with aluminum oxide, the strength goes down significantly. So you want to be careful. 
Um, there are different, you know, percentages and times for hydrofluoric acid. I just like to use 5% 20 seconds. That's really the recommended manufacturer's, you know, recommendation for like Emacs restorations. Um, different timing and silent applications. It shows, you know, 5% uh, 5, 5 20 seconds with silane does have really good results. And then um, Geraldo also showed that agitating with phosphoric acid for 30 seconds also increases the bond strength uh, to lithium disilicate restorations. Okay, so after all this treatment is done, um, I like to isolate the area. I like to use Mr. Thirsty or Isovac. Um, you can use rubber dam, which is probably the most effective way to use it. I like to work in different quadrants, so I like to use Mr. Thirsty. And then we clean the tooth with the uh, micro etch, 27 micron aluminum oxide. And after I do this, I actually go into the lab and start working on the treatment process. And then my assistant comes in and she can polish the tooth surface with either preppies or concepsis scrub. Now these don't have any fluoride in it. Don't use the profi paste because those have uh, oil and fluoride, which will prevent the bond, uh, bond strength or lower the bond strength. So you want to use preppies. They don't have fluoride in it. And even better is Concepsis scrub, which is chlorexidine in a scrubbing form. You can scrub the tooth or polish it with it. And after that, my assistants also pack cord around it to prevent cravicular fluid come from coming into the area. And then I come back with my restoration and then I apply Katana cleaner on the tooth and I scrub for 10 seconds. After this, I selectively etch the enamel for about 20 seconds, rinse, and then I apply the Concepsis liquid form to inhibit MMPs and also it disinfects the tooth. After that, you apply the primer for 20 seconds and you thoroughly dry with mild air and then you load the restorations, okay? Now I use, I, I use a micro brush to remove excess after I put it in and that's not just to clean the, the excess. I just wanna make sure my restorations are seated all the way and my margins are sealed. Okay, so after I just kind of do a little bit on the buckle and the lingual, just to make sure the restoration is seated all the way, we do a tack cure for about three to five seconds or wave cure, make sure the restoration doesn't move. And then we go ahead and take our floss and clean between the restoration, make sure the restorations don't stick together. And this is really important. Um, I have actually had an incident where I forgot to floss and the two crowns stuck together. I could not get through with any of the serrated saws or anything. Um, and I had to bring the patient back another time to actually remove the cement. So make sure you floss to so you can get the floss through the interproximals. And then you apply glycerine gel to eliminate the oxygen inhibited layer. And then you do a final cure. I like to do at least 40 seconds per surface. And when you're doing this, uh, the, the, you know, the heat, the, it can overheat the tooth and cause pulpitis. So you want to make sure you're blowing air onto the tooth so you're not overheating the tooth. And then after you're done with that, you want to maintain isolation for about three minutes, okay, according to manufacturer's recommendation. After that is all done, you start removing the cord. And then you want to clean up with Montana Jack. I use a number 12 blade for interproximals. Then I also use serrated strips and then interproximal strips as well to clean up in between. After all that's done, I use a brownie point, which will remove a lot of the composites in between uh, subgingival. You can also use a composite polisher to remove all the excess and basically clean up the root surfaces where you may have scratched it with your um, you know, scalers while removing. After the restorations are seated, um, you want to blow some air in between the two to make sure that there's no excess cement. You want to visually see it. Uh, and you want to take an x-ray to confirm that there's no excess cement. Now, you may have to take multiple tries. I mean, in this case, I took one. I said, okay, let me get that. I tried it again. Then I still see cement. So I removed it again. And now we finally don't have any cement. So uh, you want to make sure you want to, uh, you know, take x-rays until you don't see any cement anymore. Because if you do have excess cement, that is going to cause a lot of inflammation in the gums. So you want to prevent that. Um, from happening and um, not making the gums too angry, okay? When you're bonding to metal using Panavia V5, 
you want to sandblast the metal, steam clean it, and then on the metal, use an alloy primer and then a ceramic primer on the zirconia superstructure. Okay, and then you want to cement it with the panavia. So this can be used for, you know, inside the mouth uh, when you're doing a cement retained implant restoration or a, um, you know, scrumentable restoration. Okay. All right. So that's about it for panavia V5. Let's talk a little bit about the SA Cement Universal. This is really, uh, this is a very good cement. And one of the best thing, best features about this cement is it is easy to clean up. Uh, Panavia V5 is a great cement. I've been using it for almost seven years now, but it, it is a very hard cement to to clean up because it is so hard. It, it sets so hard. If you don't do it properly, you know, it you, it'll take a lot of effort to remove all the excess cement, but it does bond really, really well. SA Cement Universal is much, much easier to clean. It still has the MDP monomer in it, and it has the long carbon chain silane coupling agent, uh, which bonds really well to different materials, and it's more stable than the traditional silane. So looking at the bond strength to the tooth and the restorative material, uh, the SA Cement Universal does a little better than the cement uh, SA Cement Plus, and it does a little bit better in the light cure mode as well, okay? And it does still bond really well to katana, like zirconia restorations and lithium disilicate restorations. Metal is also great. When you use it with the clear fill universal bond quick, the bonding agent, the bond strength to enamel and dentin goes up quite significantly. So this is one of the things that if you use it with the bonding agent, you can get similar bond strength to Panavia V5. So uh, this is another alternative resin cement that you can use that has really good bond strength, but it, it's a little bit easier to clean, clean up than Panavia V5. Now, comparing the properties with SA Cement Universal and V5, uh, the compressive strength is pretty good. Uh, you know, the flexural strength is a little bit lower than V5, uh, but the, and the film thickness is pretty similar. Uh, working time is pretty good as well. The best part about this cement is the storage. So V5 has to be refrigerated. Uh, the SA Cement Universal can be stored at room temperature. So this is really convenient for you know, all the staff. They don't have to remember to put it back in the fridge all the time. And the best part about this cement is really the cleanup part. It is really easy to clean up. Uh, after you seed it, you tack cure, and then it just comes off really, really easily. So where do I use SA Cement Universal? You can use it for any of the applications that I had just mentioned. Same protocol as Zirconia. The difference between Panavia V5 and this one is you don't have to put a ceramic primer inside the restoration. So it saves you a lot of time in the lab. So after you sandblast and steam clean, you just put the Katana cleaner in it and then ultrasonic, and then you just seed it right away. Same with lithium disilicate. You just etch hydrofluoric acid, phosphoric acid, ultrasonic clean, and then you just seed it. You don't have to apply any kind of primer on the restoration itself. So looking at, you know, and when I'm looking at a bridge like this of, you know, with two double abutted bridge from 6 through 11, and it has a pretty big pink component to it, Cleanup has to be, you know, it done really well. I don't want excess cement underneath those ponics. So in this type of case, I would use uh, Panavia SA Cement Universal with the bonding agent in it to get the maximum bond strength and have easy cleanups here. So in this case, I used a Katana HTML and uh, these beautiful porcelain was done by Songbin Im. And the patient was really happy with the final result of this case. This is another case where we're cementing it on uh, metal abutments here. So in this case, the titanium abutments were treated with alloy primer. The zirconia, the katana HTML restoration again, uh, was treated with ceramic primer after it was sandblasted. And then it was cemented with uh, Panavia SA Cement Universal so that the cleanup would be a lot easier for this case. For the Panavia V5, I'd like to talk about the aesthetic aspect of it or, you know, color changes. It has a lot more color. It has five shades. You can use it for uh, universal is for most cases. They also have a translucent cement. Opaque is for if you have a really dark uh, prep. And if you have 
if you want to bring up the brightness of the restoration, you can use a white cement. And if you want to increase chroma for a cement, you can also use brown as well. Panavia V5 comes in with all these triune paste, so you can actually try the restoration in with these tri uh, glycerine-based triune pastes. Uh, when you do this, you can actually see uh, if you don't if you have a shade mismatch, you can alter the shade a little bit with the cement if your restorations are ultra thin. Okay, so that's the thing I like about you know instead of you know sending it back to the lab and having it you know you know refabricated or you know porcelain redone. You can try it with a cement to see if you can alter the shade just a little bit. So in this case, the patient came in, he fractured number nine. So I prepared a, mar a very uh, conservative margin around this tooth. So it is a, an extremely thin restoration. When I tried this restoration in with the, with the universal shade, the chroma increased quite a bit. Okay. So this is one of the things um, that I always look for when I'm using the uh, universal shade, it does tend to increase the chroma or the color intensity of the restoration if the restoration is really thin, okay? And the stump shade has a little bit more chroma. So you can see that the cervical aspect has a lot more tense, intense chroma compared to the previous photo. So I used a white cement, uh, white uh, try and paste this time. So the color match is really good. Uh, the only thing about the white cement is the white cement can look very opaque. Uh, so the trine, you know, the trine paste is a little bit more translucent than the actual real cement. So uh, this one looked pretty good, but I didn't want it to be too opaque so you can actually see the prep. So I mixed the white cement with clear uh, cement, which will increase the translucency. So I used it 70% to about 30%. Uh, and this was really the sweet spot, and that was able to match the color pretty well, and the patient was extremely happy with the final result. Panavia also has a new cement coming out. Uh, it's the Panavia Veneer LC. It's a light cured cement. Uh, I'm excited to try this cement out. This is uh, similar to V5, but it has a longer working time, so you can cement more restorations. With Panavia V5, I usually cement only about up to four restorations at a time um, because the setting time is pretty quick. Uh, with LC cements, we can uh, the veneer cement, uh, we're hoping that we can use a little bit more, uh, we can have a little bit more time. So if you're seeding like six through 11 restorations, you can use the cement uh, and you can take your time, make sure it's seeded all the way and do a tack cure and then kind of um, you know remove the excess. So which one will you use? All the cement that we talked about, the V5, the SA Cement Universal, or even the veneer cement. These are the four criterias that I look again. I look at how easy is it going to be remove the excess? Uh, is it going to be very difficult if the roots are really close together in the molar area, or the, if you have really hard access to get to, you know, in between the proximals between number two and three? I'll probably use something like an SA Cement Universal so it's easy to remove. If you need extra retention, if you need extra strength, and if you want the maximum aesthetic for the patient, then I'll probably use V5, okay? So here uh, you can see number two was a restoration that was done, but the uh, proximals have opened up and the patient was packing food in there for many years. Uh, deep carries on the mesial of number two and also on the distal of number three. So in this type of case, you know, the mesial margin of number two is quite deep. So I would feel a lot more comfortable and, and you know, the, the tooth is slightly buckly positioned. So in this type of case, when the patient opens their mouth, the, you know, the condylar head or the coronoid process swings forward and it just completely, you know, obliterates the site and you can't really get instruments in there. So in this case, I would choose to use uh, SA Cement Universal with the bonding agent to maximize the bond strength and have good retention. If you have a really, really conservative uh, crown that has very short, you know, prep walls like this, then I would use a zirconia restoration with uh, Panavia V5. If you want extra strength, for patients like this who like to basically eat their teeth, um, this patient, you know, has been wearing down his teeth for many, many years, and he comes in with a broken tooth, comes in with fractured, you know, implant restorations. 
these type of patients, you want to use a very strong restoration like a zirconia restoration and gold restorations in the posterior. And you want to use uh, Panavia V5 with different primers, you know, alloy primers on the metal part and ceramic primer on the ceramics. And anteriors were done with uh, monolithic lithium disilicate restorations. These were all done by Songbin M, of course, ceramic primer, and then uh, I bonded in place. So these type of, you know, procedures don't, you know, I can't do this in 10 minutes or one hour. These take a very, very long time because I only see four restorations at a time. You have to remove excess, make sure the cement doesn't go on to the tooth next to it, you know. So this does take a long time, but like I said, this is really this is really where everything comes down to. You don't want to mess it up at this point because the the work that you've done all this time gets messed up if you don't deliver the restorations in the right place. So the patient is extremely happy after this rehab. And another patient here, uh, this was one of the staff that at the practice that I used to work in. So she really didn't like her front teeth. Uh, misalignment. So I realigned her teeth. And when I realigned her teeth, her teeth are very triangular. So she had all these black triangles. She wanted really beautiful restorations. So we did three, um, three quarter veneers here and lithium disilicate restorations by Songbin Im. And we bonded this in place because I wanted the maximum aesthetics, strength, and um, retention. So patient's extremely happy with this. And uh, these were all used with Panavia V5. I'd like to just end the presentation with, uh, with one patient, with Catherine. This was a patient that was referred to me from the dentist that I used to work for. And uh, the patient was tired of fracturing her front fillings here. And she said, I'm tired of redoing these. Give me the strongest crown that you have. So she came in to get crowns on number eight and nine done. When I looked at her mouth, uh, I said, you know, actually you have, not only do you have, uh, you know, a clenching and grinding habit, but I think your teeth are misaligned. And, you know, because of this misalignment, it's actually fracturing your restorations. So I had recommended to realign her lower teeth and um, do restorations from six through 11 and on the bottom front for uh, three incisors. Now, the patient was kind of shocked because she just came in for two restorations and I recommended, you know, extracting an incisor, realigning, you know, doing orthodontic treatment and then restoring those three incisors with veneers. But I did a mock-up. I did a wax up and I did a mock-up. And when I did the mock-up, she was really, really happy. And she said, I want this smile. I want to get this done. So with this mock-up, she was inspired to move forward with the treatment. So I extracted her lower incisor here, realign the teeth. Uh, I referred her to an orthodontist to intrude the lower incisors and uh, evenly space out the lower incisors here. Basically, when we intrude teeth, we have to remember that uh, a lot of the orthodontists, when they intrude teeth, they actually uh, procline the lower incisors. So you have to specifically tell them to retrocline the teeth after the teeth are intruded because the reason why I'm intruding and trying to level the gingival level and retrocline them is to reduce the amount of preparation that I do for these. I'm trying to preserve as much enamel as possible so I don't have to prep them away and I can just do an additive restoration. So for this patient, uh, we were able to create some space between the upper and lower incisors and uh, key is enamel. You want to keep it as much as possible to minimize tooth deflection. So I did another wax up and I did a mock-up, prepped through the mock-up, made new provisional restorations. And this is the final prep. Try to preserve as much enamel as possible. And I made, or Sungbin M made a monolithic lithium disilicate veneers for the lowers and for the top, uh, the laterals and the centrals were layered and the canine was monolithic. And these were all bonded in with Panavia V5 and the patient was extremely happy with her new result. And this is how she looks even after a year. Okay. She's been having, uh, she had this restoration for over three years now. She's still doing really well. Uh, and yeah, these were all successfully executed restorations using a very strong resin cement. Okay. So that's about it.
I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And now I will take questions from the audience.